So, hello everybody and welcome, welcome uh, uh, to this, the first in a series, a mini series of seminars uh, about arbitration. It is the first of a series of four and details of the further sessions in the series will be on the website and sent out by the usual mailers. So uh, no spoilers, I'm gonna leave you with a sense of anticipation as to what is coming up, but keep your eyes peeled for uh, sessions two, three and four in this series. Session one today uh, is focusing on jurisdiction, uh, on section nine challenges and the tribunal's jurisdiction over third parties. Uh, so first up, uh, we will have uh, Ben Woolgar talking about section nine challenges and about the Re Republic of Mozambique case, and, and then talking about the jurisdiction of the tribunal over th third parties, uh, we will have Jasper Dillon QC and Fred Hobson looking at it from an English law perspective and then a New York and California law perspective. Uh, and each of those talks will be interesting and informative in and of themselves. But I know that the panel members are all very hopeful that they will serve to get us into a wider discussion about the underlying topics, which are, which are very interesting ones. How one deals in the context of arbitration with third parties and with, with the benefit of a comparative law overview, whether English law has the, ba the balance right on that. Uh, uh, equally, that the challenges and pitfalls of dealing with comparative law and with foreign laws in the context of arbitration. So we're hoping that we will come on to, to that, to a discussion about those wider topics after the talks. Uh, questions. Yes, we very much welcome questions, either tied specifically to an individual talk or ones more generally arising in relation to the underlying topics. So Please do raise questions, let us know your experiences, let us know your thoughts. You can type them into the questions box and they will be through a process slightly more complicated than it should be, will be fed through to me. Uh, and I will do my best to raise as many of them as I can and our eminent panelists will do their best to answer as many of them as they can. Uh, so first up, uh, Ben Woolgar talking about section nine challenges. Uh, ben is a well-established commercial junior who will be familiar to many of you already. Uh, he specialises in heavy-duty, high-profile commercial litigation and arbitration with a broad commercial practice spanning civil fraud, energy, banking, mining, insurance, etc. Uh, and he will be telling us about Section 9 challenges and the Republic of Mozambique case. Ben, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Finn. Uh, Paul, can we go immediately to the first slide? Uh, so I'll start by simply uh, bringing up on the screen uh, the text of Section 9 of the Arbitration Act itself, for those of you who might be less familiar with it, uh, and in particular subsections 1 and 4, which are the key provisions uh, when applying for a stay. Now, as you will see, Section 1 provides that a party to an arbitration agreement against whom legal proceedings are brought in respect of a matter which under the agreement is to be referred to arbitration may apply for a stay. Uh, just drawing attention to a couple of features of section nine, uh, the eagle-eyed will notice that it's only relevant where you've already been sued in the English courts. Uh, so it is of course not the only circumstance in which uh, the court will have to determine the existence, scope and enforceability of an arbitration agreement. Uh, it might be uh, that the court is instead called upon to grant an injunction to compel arbitration uh, rather than foreign proceedings uh, or indeed to prevent foreign proceedings in favour of English arbitration uh, or it might, uh, the court might be faced with a challenge to enforcement under section 67 of the Act. Section 9 is the relevant provision where, as I say, English proceedings are commenced against you uh, and you wish to apply to instead refer them to arbitration. Now, subsection 4 uh, provides that the court shall grant a stay unless satisfied that the arbitration agreement is null and void, inoperative or incapable of being performed. Uh, and the only thing really to draw attention to there is that the stay is a mandatory one, 
and I'll come back to this point, but Section 9 stays, unlike most other stays uh, in our jurisprudence, forum convenience stays, case management stays, and so on, uh, are mandatory. The court doesn't have a discretion about whether or not it grants a stay under Section 9, even in circumstances where it might make case management very difficult. Uh, Paul, next slide, please. So I want to start first with some key principles uh, about Section 9, some of which I'll already have touched on. The first point to make is that it is based on Article 2 of the New York Convention uh, on the Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitration Awards. And for that reason, the English courts seek to give it a broad internationalist interpretation that is in keeping with the way it is, uh, the, the equivalent provisions are addressed in other courts. Now, that notwithstanding, uh, for those of you who have experience of civil law systems, and in particular, continental European arbitration, uh, Section 9 operates in a way which is in fact slightly unfamiliar to most foreign lawyers, because the English court is called upon to make the decision about whether or not the arbitration agreement exists and whether or not it applies directly for itself. Uh, and in various ways, uh, foreign systems tend to take a slightly more pro-arbitration approach uh, in terms of allowing the arbitral tribunal to reach that decision first under competence, competence principles. Uh, the second key principle I've already mentioned uh, namely that the stay is mandatory, not discretionary. Uh, now, in particular, that is relevant where, uh, for instance, an arbitration agreement only exists in favour of one set of defendants, or even one defendant in a corporate group where many other related defendants are also parties to the litigation. It's undoubtedly the case that staying proceedings against some but not all defendants under Section 9 uh, makes case management more difficult for the English courts uh, and also makes taking proceedings further more difficult for claimants. But because what the court is doing is not exercising a discretion, but rather upholding the party's contractual bargain to arbitrate, um, that is nevertheless what it has to do. Particularly thorny issues can arise in terms of case management, where, for instance, uh, you have claims against other defendants which are parasitic on first establishing a particular wrong by the defendant against whom the proceedings are being stayed for arbitration. So, for instance, you might have a claim in inducing breach of contract against defendants two to five, where, of course, you first have to prove that the contract has been breached uh, by, let's say, defendant one. If a Section 9 stay is granted, the English court then has to grapple with the question of whether or not it should decide, in the absence of Defendant 1, whether or not there was nevertheless a breach of contract in relation to the claim against the other defendants, or wait until the tribunal has determined that for itself. The third key principle is that the agreement is one not only to arbitrate, but also not to litigate. That is to say, the parties are agreeing by an arbitration clause that they will not bring their disputes before the English court. And for a recent reference to that, you can see um, Bridge House and BAE. Why is that important? Well, uh, this will become clearer when we discuss Section 9.4 and the idea of an arbitration agreement being null, void or inoperative. But a claimant may well say, in response to a Section 9 application, well, uh, the arbitration agreement itself was procured by fraud or bribery or I lacked capacity to enter into it, it in a similar way to the allegations in the main proceedings. Now, that sort of uh, case is often more difficult to run uh, in light of Fiona Trust, but it is nevertheless one that often gets run. And the point being made in Bridgehouse and BAE is that because the party's agreement is one not to refer those matters to the English courts, the courts, or indeed to any courts, the courts have to be particularly astute to make sure uh, 
uh, that they're not trespassing on what would ultimately be the tribunal's jurisdiction. Fourth, uh, burdens of proof. Now, uh, on the face of it, uh, the section doesn't seem to set out burdens of proof on any particular party. But what the authorities establish is that the burden under section 9.1, i.e. to prove that an arbitration agreement exists and that the dispute falls within the scope of that arbitration agreement, is on the applicant for the stay, i.e. normally the, the defendant to the court proceedings. But when it comes to whether or not the arbitration agreement is void or inoperative, that burden flips and instead falls on the respondent under section 9.4. So at that point, the, the respondent to the section 9 challenge, the claimant in the proceedings, has to adduce positive evidence about the invalidity of the arbitration agreement. Otherwise, the courts will presume that it is presume that it is valid and binding. Uh, fifth, uh, what is the standard of proof? Uh, and by that, I mean, what sort of decision is the court reaching? Is it a good arguable case type decision, as it normally is uh, in jurisdiction challenges, uh, or a final one on the balance of probabilities? Well, the answer follows from what I've just said about burdens. Uh, under section 9.1, the authorities establish that the court has no power to grant a stay unless it is satisfied uh, that the dispute is one which falls to be referred to arbitration. And so when determining whether or not an arbitration agreement exists, the court has to be satisfied of that on the balance of probabilities. The same with scope, although um, to, to illustrate that, uh, one of the issues which might, for instance, arise on uh, the question of whether or not an arbitration agreement exists is whether or not the agreement has been validly incorporated into a contract between the parties. And that's something that the court might determine by hearing short evidence as well as reviewing the underlying documents. Um, obviously, it then has to consider the scope of the arbitration agreement, but that's normally a fairly short point of construction. When dealing though with section 9.4 and void, inoperative or incapable of being performed, the question is more context sensitive, and this was all explained in the Aeroflot case um, by Aikens LJ, as he then was. Uh, and the essential point is this. Um, it may well be the case that it is simply not practical for the court to deal with, uh, on the balance of probabilities, the question of whether or not Section 9.4 applies, because, for instance, uh, if you have a case that the arbitration agreement and the matrix agreement were, were both procured by bribery, the only way to reach a decision on the balance of probabilities uh, will be to effectively have a full trial of the issue. That will, A, be inconsistent with the manner in which the English courts normally deal with jurisdiction issues. But more importantly, it will also mean that the court has trespassed on the very matters which were intended to be referred to arbitration. And for that reason, uh, it, it tends to be a context sensitive decision what standard the court applies, but normally it will be sufficient for the party asserting the arbitration agreement to establish a good arguable case that it's not void. Um, so there's a very high burden on a claimant or a respondent to a section nine uh, in seeking to invoke section 9.4, because they have to establish there's not even a good arguable case that the agreement is valid. Paul, next slide, please. So, how does the court decide uh, a section 9 application? The first point I want to make, and I've already said that this is slightly unusual, is that we're all used to, in the arbitration context, the concept of competence, competence, that is that the tribunal is entitled to determine its own jurisdiction. And indeed, that is a principle which is enshrined in the Arbitration Act itself. However, in an English context, what that doesn't mean is that the tribunal decides its own jurisdiction to the exclusion of the English court. 
uh, on the contrary, uh, the English court has to positively reach a conclusion, regardless of the tribunal's own view of its jurisdiction, as to whether or not the tribunal has jurisdiction. So there are essentially three options. Uh, they're set out in the Al Naimi case. The first is that the court can simply decide to uh, address the issue in a summary fashion on the basis of the documents. So where, for instance, you have an arbitration agreement in a contract and it's indisputable uh, between the parties that the contract binds them and the only question is a question of construction as to the scope of the agreement, the court will normally decide the issue in a summary fashion. Alternatively, the court can order a trial of that issue under uh, Rule 62.83 and that might, for instance, be necessary where there is a dispute about whether or not a party is a party to the arbitration agreement at all. Um, that's one of the features of the Mozambique case, which I'll come on to, is that the signatories to the underlying contracts uh, are certain special purpose vehicles of the Republic of Mozambique. Uh, the claimant in the English litigation is the Republic itself. And so a question in that case of Swiss law arises as to who the parties to the agreement are that isn't simply a consequence of looking at documents. And so the English court may decide to direct a short trial of the issue itself. Or it can stay the proceedings under its inherent jurisdiction in favour of the tribunal. Now, uh, I, I said under its inherent jurisdiction, because one of the points made in the authorities is that where the court is staying on an interim basis to allow the tribunal to determine things for itself, uh, that's not done under section nine, because the court isn't yet satisfied that an arbitration agreement exists. And um, I've actually noted a fourth option down there, having said that there are only three, which is that the court might, decide to essentially mix and match those approaches. That's exactly what it did in the Mozambique case in the judgment that you'll see cited there, where the court decided that the question of scope could be tried effectively as a short preliminary issue, much shorter than a full trial of who the parties to the arbitration agreement were. And so it decided to do that first. Now, as it happens, the Court of Appeal having decided that the claims are within the scope of the arbitration agreement, that's proved to be a, a treacherous shortcut, so to speak. Um, but obtaining a stay under the inherent jurisdiction is a very high threshold and it will require compelling case management circumstances for the court to do so. Paul, next slide, please. Um, now, in determining whether or not a claim uh, falls within section 9.1, there is a two-stage inquiry. First, the court must decide what matters are raised by the proceedings, and that's the relevant word because it's the word used in both the New York Convention and section 9 itself, and then it must decide whether or not those matters fall within the scope of the arbitration clause. Now, not every issue raised by proceedings will necessarily be a matter. So there may, for instance, be a minor factual dispute, which if it arose as a standalone question would fall to be determined in arbitration, but isn't a matter in respect of which the proceedings are brought. Equally, as Popperwell J made clear in the Sodzovichny case cited there, any dispute or difference between the parties um, will constitute a matter. So it's not limited to pleaded causes of action. So by way of example, you might have a limitation defence or even the construction of a particular contractual provision, uh, which is um, uh, necessary uh, to be determined. Um, and that could be a matter even if it's not the whole cause of action. Secondly, the court then looks at whether or not those matters are within the scope of the arbitration clause. That's a straightforward question of construction, uh, but it can in particular uh, require evidence of foreign law as to the approach that the law governing the arbitration agreement takes to that question of construction. 
The last point to make, though, and this is the point made, one point made by the Court of Appeal in Mozambique, is that inevitably the two areas will shade into each other. It's, it's very difficult to decide what a matter is without first thinking what might be caught by the scope of the arbitration agreement. Um, so that is a whistle-stop guide to Section 9 challenges. Uh, and now I think I'm going to pass back to Finn to introduce your next speaker. Ben, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, and thank you for that whistle-stop tour of Section 9. Uh, next up is Fred Hobson, who will be talking about the English law position when it comes to the jurisdiction of the tribunal over third parties. Fred Hobson is a senior junior with a broad and successful commercial practice whose work is focused in particular on civil fraud and banking. Arbitration forms a sizable part of his practice, and he's acted in three LTI arbitrations in the last year, both led and unled, ranging from withholding tax in Russia to fraud in the London art market. So he's well qualified to, to speak on this subject. And Fred, over to you. Ben, thank you very much. Um, Paul, can we, can we actually go back a slide? Oh, no, apologies. No, you're, you're, you're OK. We'll push in. Thanks, Paul. Um, the issue which Jasper and I want to discuss is whether a claimant can make a non-party to an arbitration agreement subject to the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And we want to look at this both as a matter of English law and also as a matter of New York and California law. And as we'll come on to explain, there are significant differences between those two approaches that we like to compare and contrast. Now, our interest in this topic arises out of an arbitration which Jasper and I are currently involved in. That concerns a contract uh, governed by New York law. And what we're seeking to do is hook into the arbitration a non-party to the arbitration agreement. I'm going to begin by saying a bit more about the issue and why it matters. I'm then going to give a bird's eye view of the position under English law before handing over to Chasmere, who will cover the position as a matter of New York and California law. So this first slide um, has got a little diagram which just sets out the problem we are concerned with. And so the situation we're dealing with is a contract containing an arbitration clause between the claimant and, say, an SPB or, or a company. And there is a potential cause of action available against the parent controller of the SPB. But the parent controller is not party to the contract and therefore not party to the arbitration agreement. And in this hypothesis, let's assume the SPV has no substantial assets, so all the money is with the parent controller, and that obviously means an award against the SPV would, on the face of it, not be of any commercial value. And all of this prompts the question, can you, as the claimant, join the owner, i.e. the parent controller, to the arbitration on the basis that it's bound, or it is treated as being bound, by the arbitration agreement. And this issue is, of course, particularly acute in the arbitration context, where, needless to say, the foundational principle is that jurisdiction is consensual and based, obviously, upon an agreement to arbitrate. And, of course, one doesn't have the same difficulty, at least so acutely, in the court context. There are obviously wider jurisdictional bases to hook in uh, non-parties to the jurisdiction agreement, um, perhaps most obviously uh, the, the anchor defendant jurisdiction. Paul, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So starting then with the position under English law, uh, the, the question we're concerned with is, can you treat the owner as party to the arbitration agreement? And the answer under English law, subject to some argument at the margins, is no, or at least very likely to be no. And I leave aside issues such as innovation and assignment. Obviously, that's a much more straightforward example of the transfer of the obligation or the burden of the arbitration clause. So if we leave that to one side, there are two potential avenues in play. The first is an agency avenue, where basically you'd be saying that the company which it has uh, contracted uh, has done so as an agent for the undisclosed principal being the parent. That may be arguable on, on particular sets of facts, but by and large, that will be uh, uh, exceptional and, and, and will typically uh, uh, not bear fruit. The second avenue is what I really want to focus on in a bit more detail, which is piercing the corporate veil. So, Paul, can we go to the next slide, please? So, this will be familiar to, uh, to uh, everyone, no doubt. This is the Preston Petrodale case, which is the leading case, 2013 Supreme Court case, on when you can pierce the corporate veil. It was always difficult before Preston Petrodell, and it's doubly difficult after this case. So a narrow, a narrow basis has, made, has been made even more limited. And the basic principles can be expressed as follows. First, the owner or controller has got to be under an existing obligation to begin with. Second, he or she then interposes a company in order to evade that obligation or to frustrate the enforcement of that obligation. And in those circumstances, it may then be possible to disregard the company's separate personality on what Lord Sumption described as the evasion principle. So just to put a, some flesh and bones on those principles, the, the obvious case, which is dealt with in Preston Petrodell, uh, where it, it is regarded, at least by law assumption, as a case where the corporate veil has been pierced, is where there is a, a car dealer who leaves his company and he's subject to a restrictive covenant for 12 months, which means that he can't carry on business uh, in, uh, as a car dealer. And what he does to get around that is to set up a company where he carries on as a car dealer, but all through a company he's set up. And he says, oh, well, the company's not subject to the stricter covenant, and therefore the company can trade. And that's a classic example where the company is being interposed to evade an obligation which the owner or controller was under. Uh, and there one can identify the controller with the company. So in that case, an injunction lay against the company because the two were identified. But just two points to note about that. First of all, it is exceptional and very restricted in terms of the jurisdiction. And secondly, a, a point we'll come back to is that this is aimed at giving you a remedy against the company as opposed to a remedy against the owner or controller. Paul, can we go to the next slide, please? So VTB and Neutrotech was actually a case decided shortly before Preston Petrodell. Again, it's another Supreme Court case. But it's actually easier to analyse this case once one has the framework from Preston Petrodell. So in this little diagram at the bottom, we can see the overall shape of this case so far as it's relevant for our purposes. So we've got VTB, the claimant, which has a contract with a company, RAP, and that contract contains an English jurisdiction clause. 
RAP was owned by the controller, Mr. Malafiv, and the question was, can the owner controller be treated as a party to the contract? And that was of particular relevance because BTB was seeking to say that the English jurisdiction clause should be extended uh, so as to attach to Mr. Malafiv. And the answer the Supreme Court gave was a resounding no to the claimant's uh, ambitious suggestion. And there are two conceptual problems in play here. Firstly, this isn't a situation where the owner or controller is evading an existing obligation or liability to which he is subject. An important point made is that it is not an abuse of the corporate form to cause a liability to be incurred by the company in the first place, which is obviously what happened in this case. And secondly, and really a corollary of that, the doctrine of piercing the corporate veil cannot be used to hold the controller liable as if he is a contracting party when actually he isn't party to the contract. And one sees quite a bit of discussion in BTB and Nutritech that identifying who are the parties to a contract, this is classic contractual formation analysis, one has to objectively ask, uh, what would a reasonable bystander consider in terms of the identity of the parties have in regard to the communications across the line? And the simple point is, is that no one actually thought Mr. Malafi was party to the contract, and therefore the doctrine of piercing the culture veil can't be used to effectively make him party to a contract when he isn't. Um, so that's a, 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 a canter through the piercing the culture veil doctrine, so far as it applies to this question of whether you can loop in a third party to a jurisdiction clause, or obviously in our case, an arbitration agreement. And uh, as these cases show, it is next to impossible under English law to be achieving that. Uh, I'll now hand over to Jasbir, who will explain the differences between that approach and the position as it applies under New York law. Fred, thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, so there you go, you've got the English introduction, uh, and now it's time for the American perspective uh, from Jasper Dillon. Uh, Jasper is a well-established commercial silk that will be known to many of you already, uh, having taken silk back in 2013. He has a wide commercial practice, both in litigation and arbitration, dealing with the full range of commercial disputes. Of particular relevance to his talk today, Jasper has US experience. Having studied at Harvard, he worked in New York for three years with Cravath, and he is admitted to the New York State and Federal Bars, and also to the US Supreme Court Bar. So he has the qualifications and the background to give us the perspective on the jurisdiction of the tribunal over third parties from a New York and Californian law perspective. So Jasper, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Finn, for that very uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, uh, although it's quite right that uh, the um, uh, my US law experience uh, has been uh, uh, extensive, I, I still feel uh, very much an English lawyer. And as a general proposition, I think it's fair to say that any English lawyer who ventures into the domain of expressing views on a foreign system of law should all, always do so with a degree of diffidence and anxiety. Uh, but tempered, obviously, in this case, because, uh, uh, as Finn says, uh, I am a member of uh, a number of uh, US bars, including New York State. Uh, and I did practice in those courts uh, three years ago, oh, sorry, for three years, but obviously um, a long, long time ago. In international arbitration, New York law and other US law issues frequently arise. But I think before I uh, get into the meat of uh, my talk, 
and uh, talk about New York and California law. I think it is important to uh, recognize the fact that although English, uh, sorry, US law judgments are written in English and they obviously use a familiar common law method, certainly familiar to English law eyes, that doesn't necessarily mean that English lawyers should be uh, confident they fully appreciate the relevant US law principles that are set out in those judgments, or perhaps importantly in the context of arbitration, in deciphering how is a US court likely to apply those principles, which of course is a fundamental question whenever one is deploying uh, a foreign law uh, uh, argument uh, in uh, a, a tribunal which is uh, um, foreign to the, uh, the, the relevant law. Now let me give you two examples of important context well, when reading US judgments that may escape English readers. The first is that it's not always apparent to an English reader of a US judgment what system of law that a US court is actually applying, and that's especially so in the context of arbitration. Now, US uh, conflicts of laws is fiendishly complex because there are 50 states in the Union, each of which has its own uh, system of law. And on top of that, you also have a US federal uh, legal system. Now, whilst in US arbitration law, that is a matter governed by federal law, questions such as the law that govern an arbitration agreement or questions concerning whether a corporate veil should be pierced, will in general terms be governed by state law. But it is not always clear when uh, reading US judgments concerning arbitration, whether they are applying to a particular issue uh, US federal law or whether they are applying uh, a state uh, law. The other point that I'd invite uh, the audience to note flows from the fact that US law still enshrines a constitutional right to trial by jury, even in civil cases. Now, this talk is not the opportunity to debate the merits of uh, bench trial versus jury trials in civil cases, although many of my former colleagues in the US will still swear that uh, jury trials uh, or juries uh, very rarely get the answer wrong. But what matters for present purposes is that there is a, often a paucity of case law which involves a US judge applying the relevant principles and determining the answer on the facts to a particular case. And what one often finds in US uh, 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 judgments is case law which deals in, in a vacuum in terms of identifying the principles of law, but only for the purpose of determining whether the plaintiff's allegations are fit for trial or whether they should be summarily uh, dismissed. Now, this feature of US law will present uh, deep challenges for any lawyer to trying to determine how will a US court, which might be a, a judge or uh, might be a jury, will actually apply the relevant law to the facts of a particular case. So with those caveats, let me uh, address uh, the New York law principles that are applicable when an issue is raised as to whether or not the corporate veil should be pierced. I'm not going to deal separately with California law in relation to uh, those principles, what was also called alter ego liability, because those principles are very similar. And indeed, in a well-known uh, US uh, uh, District Court for the Southern District of New York decision called Mobius Management, uh, the court observed that New York law and California law are essentially the same for uh, veil piercing. So under New York law, the basic principle is that the court will disregard the corporate form or pierce the corporate veil whenever necessary to prevent fraud or to achieve equity. Uh, the concept of piercing the corporate veil under New York law is regarded as equitable in nature and assumes that the corporation itself is liable for the obligation sought to be imposed. Now, any decision as to whether or not a New York court will pierce the corporate veil will always necessarily depend on the attendant facts and equities so that 
that even on a review of all the New York cases, you cannot actually reduce the the um, uh, the, the, the principles to definitive rules that will govern all of the varying circumstances in which that power might be exercised. But essentially, piercing the corporate veil requires showing three uh, of the three prongs of the relevant test. First, uh, do the owners of the relevant corporation uh, exercise complete domination of that corporation in respect of the transaction that is being attacked? The second prong of the test is whether the domination uh, that was exercised was used to commit either a fraud or a wrong against a plaintiff, and whether that um, uh, resulted in unjust injury to the plaintiff. Now, the first requirement has been observed, uh, this requirement of showing domination uh, of the corporation has been described as the key to piercing the corporate veil. And it requires a showing that the owner has exercised such control that the corporation has become, uh, and th th these words are used often, a mere instrumentality of the owner. Now, in order to determine whether complete control or domination exists, the New York courts have considered numerous factors, uh, some of which are as follows. Uh, disregard of corporate formalities and paraphernalia, such as issuance of stock, collection of directors, keeping of corporate records. Secondly inadequate capitalization of the company. Thirdly, intermingling of funds between the alter ego and the corporation. Fourthly, overlap in ownership, officers, directors, and personnel, which may uh, be the case where you have uh, two corporate uh, entities, one being the relevant party and the second being the alleged alter ego. Fifth, uh, common office space, address, and telephone numbers of corporate entities. Sixth, the degree of business discretion shown by the dominated corporation. Seventh, whether the uh, dealings between the related entities are at arm's length, whether the corporations are treated as independent profit centers, uh, uh, the existence of a payment or guarantee of the dominated entity's debts by the dominating entity, and lastly, the intermingling of property between the entities. In other words, whether the corporation in question had property that was used by the other. Uh, corporations as if it were its own. But importantly, all the New York decisions emphasize no one factor is decisive. The second requirement to show that domination or control was used to commit fraud or a wrong is not limited to showing common law fraud. It also extends to showing conduct that amounts to a dishonest or unjust act, or even extends to a breach of a legal duty in contravention of the plaintiff's legal rights. The New York Court of Appeals said uh, in a decision uh, called Morris that this requirement involves showing that the owner, through its domination, perpetrated a wrong or injustice against that party such that a court in equity will intervene. Therefore, if an affiliate or parent company uses domination and control to cause its subsidiary to breach a contractual obligation for personal gain, <clears throat> and all which causes the plaintiff financial loss, that amounts to misuse of the corporate form to commit a wrong justifying the corporate veil being pierced. An allegation that a parent a, a company has abused its control of a subsidiary by causing it to engage in harmful transactions that shield assets from the plaintiff or expose plaintiffs to significant liability is capable of meeting this requirement. Then we get to the third requirement, which is to show that the wrongful or unjust act caused the plaintiff's injury, and that is usually straightforward and is often considered together with the second requirement of uh, showing wrongful uh, conduct. So New York courts typically will find that the second and third requirements are satisfied where a dominating party has used its control to place assets beyond the reach of creditors or otherwise avoid obligations, because the diversion of assets which render a corporation judgment proof is regarded as a wrong or deceptive and unjust abuse of the corporate form for the purposes of piercing the corporate veil and then self-evidently causing loss to the plaintiff. It, it is well established uh, uh, under New York law that piercing the corporate veil doctrine can be relied upon to bind a person to an arbitration agreement, 
to which they are not a party. Uh, that was established by the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York in the Mobius Management uh, case, where it's held that an officer and the shareholder of a corporation that signed an arbitration agreement was bound by that agreement to submit to an arbitration claim for the corporation's debt, where the officer directed the corporation to sell its assets and distribute the proceeds for purposes other than paying its creditors. So that's a, a basic summary of the, of the, of the three uh, principles or the three prongs of the New York law test for alter ego liability. But I think perhaps the best insight into the New York court's robust approach to the alter ego doctrine, where it is perceived that the privilege of incorporation is being abused to commit a wrong, um, is apparent from a 1997 decision of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, which includes New York, called Freeman and Complex Computing. And I'd like to uh, uh, outline that case um, uh, shortly. The facts, in summary, were as follows. So Mr. Glacier was a graduate student at Columbia University who had co-developed a piece of computer software which had a uh, significant potential commercial value. Now, Mr. Glazier negotiated with Columbia University for the grant of a license to use the software, but Columbia was unwilling to license the software to a company of which Gl Mr. Glazier was a director or shareholder. However, Columbia was willing to license the software to a company which retained Mr. Glazier as an independent co contractor. As a result, in 1992, uh, the um, Complex Computing Corporation was incorporated uh, with a friend of Mr. Glacier as the sole shareholder and director, and a company called Glacier Inc., whose sole shareholder and director was Mr. Glacier, was retained by Complex Computing as an independent contractor to develop and market the software. So Mr. Glacier was the sole signatory on Complex Computing's bank account, and he was also given a written option to purchase all of Complex Computing shares for $2,000. In 1993, Complex Computing entered into agreement with the eventual plaintiff, Mr. Freeman, under which Mr. Freeman agreed to sell, market, and license compute, uh, Complex Computing software products for five years in exchange for commission. And this agreement, the Complex Computing and Freeman agreement, was subject to an arbitration agreement. In 1994, Complex Computing granted a company called Thompson Investment Software an exclusive worldwide uh, agreement uh, and license to sell and market the software, and then decided to give Mr. Freeman notice of termination of his agreement uh, with Complex Computing on the basis that, and I quote, that to combat the overly generous termination um, compensation we committed to. Thompson then hired Mr. Glazier in 1995 on a very handsome salary, and they acquired Complex Computing's intellectual property for $750,000. It's no surprise that Mr. Freeman then later in 1995 commenced a claim against Complex Computing, Thompson and Mr. Glazier, claiming in excess of $5 million for breach of contract, inducing breach of contract, and fraudulent conveyance. Now, the defendant sought to stay the claims on the grounds that the claim against complex computing was subject to arbitration, and the claims against, Mr. Um, against Thompson and Mr. Glacier should await the conclusion of the arbitration. But Mr. Freeman then responded by moving to compel all of the defendants to arbitrate on the ground that Thompson and Glacier were complex computing's older, uh, computers alter egos. The US District Court denied the motion in relation to Thompson, but it found, applying New York law, that Mr. Glacier was subject to the arbitration clause in the Complex Computing Freeman Agreement because he was the alter ego of Complex Computing, which was a party to that contract. And that uh, conclusion was challenged uh, by Mr. Glacier on appeal to the US Court of Appeals. Given that Complex Computing was a New York corporation, neither party disputed that New York law was the choice of law that was applicable to that issue of whether Mr. Glacier was uh, com complex computing's alter ego. Now, uh, Judge Minor gave the majority judgment in the Court of Appeals, and he held that New York law recognized the concept of equitable owner of a corporation if it exercises 
considerable authority over the corporation to the point of completely disregarding the corporate form and acting as though the, the assets of the corporation are the alter egos alone to manage and distribute. On what were described as the unique facts of the case viewed in their totality, Judge Minor held that Mr. Glazier was the equitable owner of complex computing. And he endorsed the district judge's view that to regard Mr. Glazier as anything other than the sole stockholder and controller of uh, complex computing would be to exalt form over substance. However, uh, the district judge only made a finding uh, as to the domination problem. Uh, and Judge Minor, uh, together with um, uh, his uh, fellow uh, judge in the majority, uh, made the point that domination or satisfaction of the domination prong alone is not sufficient and that a suitable case for veil piercing needs to satisfy on the facts that the use of domination to commit the wrong resulted in a loss to the plaintiff. And so in the absence of findings on those last two prongs of the alter ego test, the majority of the Court of Appeals remanded the case to the district court to determine whether or not those two elements of the test were um, established. Uh, there was a dissent um, by uh, 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 a judge, Judge uh, Godbold. Uh, so while he concurred with the majority judgment in upholding the district court's view on the first prong of the test, he dissented in the result because he saw that there was no need to remand the use of domination issue um, uh, to uh, the district court. He regarded the record on appeal disclosed uh, fraud or other wrong by Mr. Glazier, and that resulted in unjust loss to the plaintiff. Using uh, Judge Godbold's words, I quote, in some corporate veil cases, one must search the record for evidence shedding light on whether an individual's control of the corporation has been used to commit a fraud or wrong, resulting in unjust loss or injury. Not in this case. Here, it all hangs out, close quotes. And then Judge Godbold proceeded to describe how complex computing was Glacier's, Mr. Glacier's creature and was essentially a shell and was subject to complete control by Mr. Glacier. And Judge Godbold then concluded that the transfer of complex computing's business to Thompson, the handsome rewards that were given by Thompson to Mr. Glacier, and then the stripping of Mr. Freeman of his benefits and being, quotes, hung out to dry uh, because those benefits were perceived as being too generous. Uh, in Judge Godbold's view, that was a fraud or at least a wrongful injury uh, caused to Mr. Freeman by Mr. Glacier. And memorably, Judge Godbold described this state of affairs as a, quotes, tinker to Evans to chance play. Now, this is another example of why English lawyers uh, ought to accept George Bernard Shaw's aphorism that England and America are two countries separated by a common language. The tinker to Evers to chance play is a reference to a double play completed by three Chicago Cubs baseball teammates in the first decade of the 20th century and eulogized famously in a poem. Now, this play is understood to mean, in American English, a task accomplished by well-executed teamwork. In this particular case, the teamwork was between Thompson and Glacier to carry out a fraud or wrongful injury to Mr. Glacier. Uh, sorry, to Mr. Freeman. There is little doubt that the result that uh, certainly Judge Godbold came to uh, would be highly unlikely to be reached under uh, English law. I think a question that remains, uh, for, and perhaps we can discuss this in the panel, or um, uh, it would be interesting to hear the views of the audience, uh, is whether English law, which has hitherto placed most weight on the need for certainty rather than justice in an individual case involving an alleged abuse of the privilege of incorporation, whether English law has the balance right or whether New York law has achieved a better balance. I think I'll pause there to uh, hand back to Finn.
Jasper, thank you very much indeed uh, um, uh, for that illuminating talk. And now we have a few more minutes uh, and uh, maybe if we get Fred back and Ben joins us too, we can perhaps try and use this uh, remaining time to discuss precisely that question about the balance, whether English law has the balance right. And it seems to me at least there are a couple of you know, obvious factors here and maybe we can work around and you can tell us uh, where you get to on them. So. Uh, one, one's got obviously party autonomy. Surely the party should be able to choose not to make the controller a party to the contract. One's got, as you say, Jasper, the questions of legal certainty versus justice in an individual case. Uh, so uh, if one sees uh, uh, each of you, perhaps, uh, uh, Ben, we can start with you, because I know in the Mozambique case, it's not what you were focusing on in your talk, but the same kind of issues arise in that case. Uh, 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 how do you see where English law is or where Swiss law in your case gets to. Uh, uh, what's your views? Thanks, Finn. So I think a lot of the balance actually derives from more fundamental points about the ways that the different laws treat how somebody might become a party to the contract. So in the Mozambique case, the argument as a matter of Swiss law is that you can have non-signatory parties to a contract and that doesn't require a relationship of agency or piercing the veil or anything like that. It's a function of the Swiss law of identification of who the parties to a contract are as a matter of the Swiss code of obligations. It's not quite as wide ranging, for instance, as what the French call the group of companies doctrine, where as a matter of arbitration law, the arbitration clause can be extended on the basis of a sort of legal fiction as to the scope of the contract. But certainly in the Mozambique case, it, the, the issue um, is ultimately just that English law and Swiss law take very different approaches um, as to how easily somebody might become a party to the contract. They both think they're upholding party autonomy. Uh, it's just that we mean very different things about party autonomy. Um, and perhaps that's not surprising because you might choose English law to govern your contract and you'll benefit from a strict approach. You might choose a civil law and then you'll benefit from a more liberal approach. Yes, well, and that raises an interesting question, doesn't it, Fred, about acting the, the question of choice of law, how one's going to determine the question uh, uh, of whether one should pierce the corporate veil or not in this kind of situation. Uh, uh, as a matter of English law, one looking at it or your facts, whose law... Uh, are you turning to to answer that question? Well, Ben, it's a fascinating question. In, in the in the time available, we 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 can't do justice to uh, we we can't open the box entirely on that question. But it is fair to make this point. When I did this arbitration with Jasper um, last year, I thought at the time, well, this is governed by New York law, this contract. So the principles we're talking about will only apply if the arbitration agreement is governed by New York law, which is the particular circumstances we, we, we had in the case of Jasper. In fact, um, at least in the arbitration context, there's much more scope for arguing that even where the matrix contract and the arbitration agreement are governed by English law, but say you've got a company incorporated in New York and you want to pierce the corporate veil of that company, it's at least arguable that you can say that the law governing the question of whether you can pierce the corporate veil is the law of the place of incorporation and in VTB, for example, Lord Newberg has said this is a very difficult question. And obviously, in the arbitration context, it's much more up for grabs anyway, because the tribunal is not bound by domestic choice of law rules. So I think yeah. the one point I would finish on there is to say, don't close your mind to the idea that you can apply some more exotic piercing the culture of bail analysis, even where your contract is governed by English law. That's an excellent point. So let, perhaps to round us off, Jasper, why don't uh, uh, I take you back to your question that you posed us collectively, whether you think English law has struck the right balance, what, where on the, on, the, on the scale do you think it should be and why? Have, have we got it wrong? Have we got it right? Well, I, I think what I would say is that, uh, you know, ultimately, in, in a sense, it's a sort of democratic question. What, what, what do most English law practitioners uh, view, view this as rather than my individual view, and I'm pretty confident that uh, English law practitioners uh, 
probably think that the balance is right and that party autonomy and legal certainty are incredibly important values uh, uh, and the Salomon and Salomon principle so that English law has it right and that if you don't like English law, you can go and choose another system of law. But of course, then that runs into the point that Fred has just made, which is you can choose whatever law that you like to your agreement, but that doesn't mean that you've excluded the possibility that a different system of law uh, applies to the alter ego argument if you are contracting with a New York law or a uh, French law or a California law governed uh, corporation. And I think that in the context of arbitration as we are, we know that it, it, in English law, as Fred says, Lord Newberg says it's a difficult question uh, what the English law complex of law, uh, where the English complex of law principles take you in terms of determining the answer, no doubt because um, uh, that's an easy way to trump whatever English law certainty and party autonomy you have, you just go to a different system of law. But in arbitration, we all know as practitioners that there are no hard conflicts of law rules in arbitration. It is very much a matter for the tribunal to determine what law it considers uh, appropriate. And so if you've got international based arbitrators who may be US or Canadian or Swiss or French, it strikes me that it wouldn't be that difficult to persuade those arbitrators that actually the question, should, uh, part, should party X be considered to be the alter ego of party Y in circumstances where party Y is incorporated in New York, California, Switzerland? That doesn't seem to me to be that difficult uh, in order to persuade uh, arbitrators who may be open. When you, yeah. have, when you have facts of a case, let's say, that are, you know, involve the tinkers to Evers to chance play, to quote uh, the New York court, uh, where those facts scream out that uh, something has gone seriously wrong here and this is a, a, an abuse. Uh, yeah. So I, I think, as to echo what Fred says, uh, I think if you're a, a claimant in arbitration, don't close your eyes to this uh, possibility. And if you're a defendant, don't assume you're safe just because you didn't sign the uh, arbitration agreement. Okay, well, I think that's probably a, a good message to end on, given we've gone slightly over time of keep your eyes open. Uh, 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 keep your eyes open at all time and keep an open mind. I think that's an excellent message for everybody. So uh, 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 I think it probably falls to me on behalf of all the attendees uh, to say a very big thank you to Jasper Dillon QC, to Fred Hobson and to Ben Woolgar for taking the time to prepare and deliver three such interesting and informative talks. Uh, I hope you have all enjoyed it. We very much uh, enjoyed having you with us. Uh, and please make sure to come back for episodes two, three, and four of the exciting arbitration mini-series coming to Netflix sometime soon. So thank you very much and enjoy your Fridays, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.